Hey, truth be told, Captain Ron here at the uh, for Tony Sweet at the 2020 UFO Mega Conference here in Laughlin, Nevada, and I've never sat down with this gentleman before, but uh, he's he's done research for uh, I'll let's just say more than 20 years in all the areas we cover here on Truth Be Told, and he's been kind enough to sit down and chat and just shoot the shit with me for a little while and talk about some of these different topics, Mr. Johnny Enoch. Um, Johnny, let's let's start off talking about. One of my favorites, which is uh, ancient aliens. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're a believer in the ancient astronaut theory? Is that right? I am a believer. If you go back into all of our ancient cultures, whether you go back into the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Akkadians, the Phoenician Canaanites, the Etruscans, everybody has this depiction that we have of these gods coming down from the heavens. They descend down into the earth, just like in the Sumerian kings list. It says that they came from the heavens a second time. We have this depicted in our gods and goddesses and angel iconography. They're having wings. Why would they have wings, Ron? It's because they're coming from somewhere. I, I, I agree. I, I think there's a lot of strong evidence for that. I'm, I, this is one of the areas that I, I do yeah. think is, is very probable. Um, what do you think some of the strongest evidence for... Um, us having off-planet help is like 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 I like to refer to Baalbek, Lebanon, you know those giant 1,600 ton blocks. Yeah. Uh, do you have some favorite sites that you think are some of the strongest evidence that we've had off-planet help? Oh my God, there's so many. Yeah. There's so many. Okay, so you know in Abydos in Egypt, we have up on the wall, uh, we have the depiction of what looks like a helicopter, a plane, a submarine. Up until recently, we would always say that that was a palimpsest. That's erosion. That's glyphs on top of glyphs. Okay, so this has become one of my favorite temples as of recently, because Abyss. yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, we always used to go there for different reasons, and I I won't go into the longer depictions and descriptions of why this temple is so significant. But uh, first of all, we find pre-cataclysmic structures in the back with the Osirion. That's all made of granite. There are no hieroglyphics in that area. There Sorry. are these flower of light patterns, there's nine of them that were probably left there by the Pythagoreans, but significantly we find this to be a very ancient structure, and then we pull in this dynastic area in the area for the temple. So when you go into this temple, what's really interesting is you find these seven rooms. We call them the Holy of Holies. And in these rooms is a false door in the back a door to the netters are the gods, right? Aren't these in other places all over the world too, these doors like that, right? They are, absolutely. Yeah. We find them all over the world. Like you go into Peru uh, and Amaru Maru, you find mm -hmm. it in the side of a mountain. You go into Bolivia, Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, you see the depictions of this false door, uh, Petra and Jordan, you know, the list goes on. Okay, so we find this false door to the netters that's in the back of these rooms, but outside of it, it says it's a stargate, okay? Now, what's really interesting is that on the walls, there are these directions, these instructions that to enter into this space, that you have to consume a substance that the only thing that we can take away from the translations is that they were consuming a type of white cakes or white gold. Interesting. This I haven't heard before. Yeah, no, it's very, very interesting. Huh. And so uh, what we know, and I can get into, a, I can get into more of a description yeah, of what ahead. those were, uh, and how that relates to alchemy, and that's a fascinating story. Uh, but when I was mentioning that up on the wall that we see that there's a depiction of airplanes, up until recently, everybody would say, no, there's, that's, that's just a palimpsest. Like I said, it's the erosion of glyphs on top of glyphs. Well, we know that all through the ancient world that we have mentioning of flying machines. I mean, look at the Indian epics. The yeah, Ramayana, the Manas, yeah. yeah, yeah, the Ramayana, the yep. Mahabharata, the Samarangana Sutradhara. Uh, we find there's depictions that you go over to Saqqara, we have a bird that's like an airplane. We have the flying man depicted on that, that temple, which is incredible. But if you want to know where this origin of, of alchemy and where there might have been an idea that we had an ability to upgrade our DNA, so we had upgraded abilities and capabilities that certain bloodlines and people in the ancient world had, we have to go back into the year 1904. Okay. Okay, Ron, I'm going to come back with me into, into the past. All right. Okay, we're going to go follow the path of a man named Sir William Flinders Petrie. He's going out into the Sinai with the British Royal Geography Society. Okay? Okay. So picture this. Everybody watching at home on the other side of that screen, Ron. We're out in the Sinai, 
and we're making this trek up into this mountain. And we're looking for something called the Moses Mountain. You call it Mount Horeb, or we call it today, Sarabit al Kadim. It's essentially the mountain of secrets. But when he goes up there, he finds a very interesting cave. And this cave is a hidden temple dedicated to the goddess Hathor. And when they go up into this cave, into this temple, they find up on the walls from the fourth all the way up to the 19th dynasty that there is a very particular tradition that these people were consuming these triangular shaped cakes. Now, why is that interesting? Because when they go up there, they find these hermetically sealed chambers that are in the ground. They walk up and they slide the chambers open. And what do they find? This white powder. So at first they think they're at Charlie Sheen's house. And then they, they, at first they just like dismiss it. They let it blow all over the place. They, they let it get adulterants. They think it's aluminum, as the British would call it, aluminum, or, or bone powder. Then they realize it's something much more precious, a white powder of gold. And we have all sorts of stories that start coming out of the ancient world about this, that they were having this substance that could be, that could be consumed that gave them sort of an upgraded ability, whether it's psychic ability or knowledge or enhanced really? intelligence. This sounds like a... Uh and this is like what upgrades their DNA, actually? Yeah. I've not heard of this. This is, this is amazing. Well, uh, Lawrence Gardner covered a lot of this in his work, the late Lawrence Gardner, when, okay. when he was looking at these sorts of discoveries. But this is, this is an essentially an amazing story because we learn later that this material or this substance uh, is linked to all sorts of other ancient stories and legends. Hmm. Uh, we learn from the Babylonian of something called the Plain of Sharon which is a place that you could transition to. Uh, we learned that out of these multi-dimensional capabilities of this substance that we refer to as Mufkuts, that there is something called the field of Mufkuts. We learn about in the fifth dynasty pyramid texts. So it's almost like hyperspace, or a space that you could essentially not only uh, transition to uh, and have multi-dimensional capabilities, but also regenerate your body. See, when you were first talking about this, I was thinking it was going to be, I thought the punchline was going to be something like an ayahuasca or something that would change people's perceptions and that was what they were doing. But you're saying that they actually physically changed. Well, we could take it a step further. Okay, so ayahuasca, it's, it's another component when you go and you look at its constituents. Uh, it works with dimethyltryptamine on the pineal gland, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we believe. Well, DMT, uh, yeah, right, right. Right. And so... Essentially, what if this is accessing those pathways? What if those is it's a what if this uh, substance that we're describing is a bioelectrical substance that's doing something to the body? It's upgrading its your pathways and opening you up. We can go further into this story. Do you know the ancient name for Egypt? No. The ancient name for Egypt was never Egypt. Egypt came from a Greek name, Egyptos. Hmm. Okay. So the ancient name for Egypt was actually called Chem or Kemet. And have you ever heard that? No. It meant the black land, hmm. okay? And so this is where you get the term chemistry or alchemy from. Interesting. It, and what it was all about is that there was this black soil that would flood up from the Nile, and it was very rich uh, with all kinds of minerals and, and different substances. So they had a way of extracting it and using it in a particular way, hmm. which is very interesting. So fast forward, we get a story out of America and about the 70s leading into the 80s. There's a man out in the Yuma Valley of Phoenix, Arizona, and his name is David Hudson. Okay? okay. Now, David Hudson, he was not only a cotton farmer, but he was also an, an amateur that was, you know, into looking at rare minerals and these sorts of things. And he's trying to grow cotton on his crops, but there's a little bit of a problem. Okay. The problem is, is that he has this black alkali soil. Does that sound familiar? Mm, like, like in chem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what you have to do out there if you grow these crops is you, you have to, you know, treat the soil. So he goes to the local copper mines and he gets 93% sulfuric acid. He starts dumping it on his land. And when he does that, it becomes white and water soluble. Okay. So at this point, he starts to say, well, maybe there's something more here uh, that I need to look at. He starts examining the soil, and when he's t treating his soil through this process, he starts to get this weird material that comes out of there. Uh, and this material, uh, he goes and looks at it. He wants to get it tested and run some processes on it. So at first it turns red, and then it turns black. 
and he goes and gets it tested to see if, hey, maybe he ran into a, a, a gold or something or a, whatever it could be. He finds out they do an extraction process and doesn't really get much out of it. Hmm. Just like silica and some nonsense. And he goes, hey, this is, there's nothing really there. So he goes to test this through a process called a spectron electron microscope. Okay? Yeah. They, at the time when he was testing this, the American... show you all the different elements. Or exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. When they were testing it, this, the American method was only to test this substance for about 15 seconds. So they go and test this substance, and they get absolutely nothing, uh, like we were saying. He, he has a friend of his that is involved with the Soviet Academy of Sciences, and they go and test the substance uh, for the, their method, which was 300 seconds, and all of a sudden they make an incredible discovery. And that incredible discovery is that these different types of areas start to show up in the platinum group of metals. You know, pleiadium, hmm. ruthenium, iridium, rhodium, gold, and they all exist at a very particular state, okay? Hmm. So this state is a very interesting state because they start, it starts to get labeled uh, orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, okay? So what, this, what he starts to discover is that this, these substances that he starts to get are in a very interesting state. Uh, you know when you examine an atom, okay. that you have the electrons whizzing around the nuclei? Right. This stuff has anti-electrons bonding with electrons so they're protruding out in this toroidal field, sort of mimicking our DNA. He starts to find out that this substance, which sub, uh, has something called the Meissner effect, when it's exposed to geomagnetic areas of the Earth, has an anti-gravitational field. Uh, uh, effect to it. Uh, it becomes lighter. There's a levitation effect. It even changes under heat, under certain sorts of pressure. It's a very interesting substance. It has different regenerative properties to the body. There's all sorts of tests start to start to being done. Uh, you know, all sorts of places, uh, military, industrial, complex sorts of companies start to get involved. He starts to, to see all sorts of versions that this could be used, and he files patents for it. Now, what's really interesting is his patents get seized in the name of national security. What year was this? Uh, this is going back now into the 80s and then into the 90s. Okay. Okay, so his patents get seized in the name of national security. Uh, things oh. start to go a little crazy with this as he's making these discoveries. And uh, what's really fascinating uh, about that whole ordeal that he had found is that if you take the subatomic particles, as he was obsessed with taking this down to a, a lower atomic structure. You go down from quarks, neutrinos, hadrons, leptons, once you go down to gluons and bosons, those are pure photonic energy with no mass. Okay? Sure. So think about this. If this happened in the Moses Mountain, and this is a substance that we would refer to like mana, that was stored in an Ark of the Covenant, think about if you could take that and put that inside of a box, you'd have the most powerful weapon on the face of the earth. And this man goes disappearing. Now, if this substance, that guy disappeared? You know, he disappeared off the scene because he, he t told everybody after that he just gave up. Okay, so think about this. If this substance is so regenerative and it came from chem, we get the Arabs what they called alchemia that became alchemy, which later people like Nicholas Flamel and everybody in Europe started to become obsessed with finding what's called the philosopher's stone. You go into guys like uh, Rudolf II over in Prague that had the Golden Lane, the power t powder tower. Uh, you have Roger Bacon. You have Paracelsius, who was known as Philippus Arioldus, Theophrastus, Bombastus, von Heinem. You have all of the, the great This Elkin. is all going to be on the test for everyone, right? Yeah. they're all going to catch everything you're saying. Okay. You better get an A+. Plus. <laughs> so uh, all these famous alchemists, they were seeking out this material uh, that could regenerate them in, in, in work in this particular way. So when, when this guy made this discovery, it was absolutely amazing that he essentially stumbled on this amazing uh, sort of the science. And we see that continued forward to this day. People say, oh, that was just a pseudoscience. Nonsense. In today's science, we don't call it orbitally rearranged monoatomic gold or the, the mineral uh, product that people sell on the internet, uh, which is not quite what Hudson stepped on uh, or stepped into accidentally. We call it hyperdeformed nuclei or exotic states of matter, but that's essentially the, the, the forefront of that science, right? In English, what is all of this? What are you saying? I mean, okay. what is, what is, I, I mean, I'm following your story, but I mean, like, what is the practical, what is, what is the, what do okay, we imagine if you Okay, imagine if you had a substance that you could use to regenerate your body 
or to upgrade you, you know, you in a particular way or restore your DNA to its full capacity. Right, like that film where you take the pill and you... you it, right, yeah. like Limitless. Limitless, that's what yeah, I Yeah, with it. Bradley yeah. Cooper. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, Just it's, like a, that. it's interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, so let me give you another story that maybe is more recent. That but we I mean, can I thought you were to. supposed to tell me how, how the Stargate thing works, if this relates yeah, to that. Uh, you think this ties yeah. into there? Absolutely. So the key on the wall of Abydos is that they were consuming this stuff like crazy. And remember... Two things. Okay, so at that temple I told you about where they were consuming this stuff, it was from the 4th all the way up to the 19th dynasty, right? Okay. Okay, everything in the dynastic Egyptian period shot up through the roof in the 4th dynasty. They figured out how to do everything. The pre-dynastics, they found Egypt. They found the pyramids. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. We know that. And they had to go figure out, they were rubbing sticks together using brick. They had to figure out what it is that they needed to do again to get to the level where the guys before them, the pre-cataclysmics. And you think everything. finding this this discovery of this this material it was, it was one of the, elevated them to be able to do it that? It was one of the keys to accessing this uh, lost ancient technology. Okay, okay. so here, here's another interesting tie-in to this whole, this whole uh, story. So, you know, we go back into that story of the Moses Mountain. Are you right. familiar with the Moses story? Of course. Okay. If you have a Bible at home, everybody flip open to Exodus and uh, go into the book of Exodus. I think it's Exodus 32:20. You go into there, and Moses is up in the up in the mountain, and he sees that the Israelites below, uh, that they were down there, and Aaron was helping them, and they put together a golden calf. Now. In the, the first story, we hear that Moses was up there getting these Ten Commandments or Edicts of the Decalogues from the fiery finger of God, which, by the way, he did not. In the Hebrew book of Yasher, it actually says that they were given to him, and the commandments are just a shorthand version that we get from the Papyrus of Ani or the 42 Negative Confessions of Matt. So he comes But up, that's another whole, whole six-hour lecture by John Eno. That's Go a ten-hour lecture, actually. Right. Six is the short version. So anyhow, he comes down the mountain, and remember, the story is, is that we hear they're, they're making a golden calf, and uh, he orders them in the, the King James Bible to burn it and grind it up into a powder and consume it. That's what it says in the King James Bible. Furthermore, remember we said this was a temple of Hathor that Sir William Flinders Petrie found in 1904. Go look up a picture of Hathor. So she, you're tying that all the way back to the Moses story as well, that it, that's the same material. It's the this same is the mountain. Same this is the mountain. I see. Okay, now think about this. Hathor, the goddess, she has the ears of a calf. Okay? So let's fast forward it now. Let's go to an E.T. story that we can relate this to. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that these are the same materials. I'm not suggesting that, that they had the same purpose. But remember that David Hudson made some very interesting discoveries on what this material could do when it was exposed to heat or radioactive uh, areas, that it had anti-gravitational properties. It was a power source, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back to the story of Bob Lazar, John Lear, Gene Huff, when he goes out to this little Mickey Mouse town called Rachel, Nevada, out to that famous place that we learned about called Area, Area 51. 51, Dreamland, S4. Okay, so they go out there and they take a little trip. When he arrives there and he heads out there and he's working there, he talks about there's nine hangars, right? Mm -hmm. In one of the hangars, there's a Vimana structure that looks like it's from an archaeological dig. Absolutely incredible. He goes over into the one hangar and he gets in trouble for running his hand along the sides of the side of this smooth craft. And he says, absolutely ominous. There's no right angles in there. It's amazing, right? Mind-blowing. Totally. Yeah. He goes into the bottom, and what does he find? Do you know that part of the story? What he finds in the bottom of the thing? Yep. Um, What's well, the little seats and all that? He finds that. He the, finds, but, I mean, we find that. Something about the power source. Yes, the, the power source. Right. You see this accelerator. Mm -hmm. He says that it used a heavy element, okay? He has a name for it, too. Element 115. That's it. Okay, so what I'm suggesting here is alien alchemy. So that, that all that stuff back to Moses, that now we've re, they, they've had 115, was in fact this other material. Well, they've had, they've had ways of, of doing this sort of thing. They've had this sort of technology for a while. Uh, they may have had different purposes. It may have been a little different. And by the way, the version of Element 115 we have today uh, is a little different uh, than what Lazar had discovered. 
And uh, remember, Lazar, after he was featured in that recent documentary, uh, he had a knock at his door. He had a visit. They were looking to see if he had any. All right. And David Adair says similar things, too, about that sort of yeah. material, that they have some things like that. So a absolutely. It's the anti-gravitational thing. So you think those properties, it's, they've, just, they've had that, that material, and they've used that for these craft. Yeah, but keep this in mind. There's all different kinds of technologies, visitors, um, of ways of getting here. And one of those ways that you know I'll be discussing here is the different stargates and portals and access we have. Okay, here. so now we're back to where we were. Okay, so now in the stargates. No, I mean seriously, that's what we were talking <laughs> yeah, about. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and 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 how do you how do you think they use these stargates? Is it is it is it physical? Is it with these ships? Is it well? How do you think that that's happening? Okay, I mean, if you go back into even our our early ufology work, look at the work of Frank Scully. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's where we get Mulder and Scully right, from, right? right? right, right. 1950s. He said that UFOs were getting here on these magnetic highways, uh, even the work of Adamski. Adamski says the same thing, okay? We now say in astronomy we have these megalanic bridges between galaxies that we see that there's these path pathways. Uh, we have guys like uh, Dr. Paul LaViolette that's here today who's talking about pulsar stars. How Could they maybe be superluminal galactic GPS systems? We have uh, a universe that's filled with uh, anomalous things. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to me that when you look at what our science is saying now, okay, look at what we're saying with the, not only the Einstein-Rosen bridge, but quantum entanglement. You and I are, are sitting in this room right now, and we think that everything's solid, obviously, but it's not. Yeah, it's like you can never truly touch something, right? Like, it, it, it can never, there's something about that, too, that you can get super close, but you can never really touch it because it's really yeah. space in between. It's craziness. It, it, it is, but, I mean, think about this. Right now, you have 100 trillion trillion cells in your body. There's 100 trillion trillion atoms in a cell and 100 trillion trillion cells on an <laughs> atom. Then atoms are made of most, mostly blank spaces. So we can take everybody in this whole world, let's say 8 billion people, and put them on the end of our pinky finger. Mm. That's how small this picture is of where we're going with this uh, idea of, and when we look further into this, one of the, one, let's say the chair that you're in, one of those little atoms, those little minute particles, that electron uh, might be at the other side of the galaxy, but it's held together through that entanglement process, right? right. So think about a tuning fork. If you could take point A to point B, and you could tune them in with sort of the same entanglement, you would have a connection there. And we've heard a long time about these wormholes and stargates and stuff like that. Really interesting uh, story is that we start to see connections a lot to places like Orion. You've probably heard that mentioned, Quite right? A million times, yeah. Right. So we, we've, we've seen people talk about the pyramids having a connection to Orion and... Uh, the belt, the same line, uh, the alignment. Absolutely. So, I mean, I started getting interested, uh, you know, in a couple concepts with this. When you look at the Romanet case, which is very controversial. Yep, very. Very controversial. People got their opinions about it. Uh, but, you know, when we look over at that, uh, there's an interesting tie in there because he was getting these strange experiences, obviously seeing ETs in his window. Uh, he was drawing equations in his sleep, interesting equations, right? And one of the things that he drew uh, that I'll be talking about here is that he drew this very interesting map with perfectly straight lines. And the, the map shows that there is a Stargate-like portal that goes from Mintaka over in Orion that looks like it brings you right over to the Pleiades. Sort of like uh, Tegeta, right? <laughs> How is that possible? Uh, well, you know, we, you could say that our whole universe uh, you know, has is built out with these kind of little highways and, and structures and strange things. So it's built into the fabric of, of our universe itself. It's just part of the construction. Yeah, and you know, it's the... And they must have discovered them, and now they figured out how to use them. Is it, that it, kind of what you're saying? It is. I mean, but here's the thing. Um, this is just a part, a small part of how our visitors, you know, could be getting here and, and what's happening with that. Uh, you know, Speaking of that particular mapping that Romanik did, a friend of mine uh, back in the day had, had was discussing that into some ufological forums. And uh, do you remember when Henry Deacon was still around? Mm -mm. Uh, Arthur Newman, he was a guy that yeah. came out talking years ago about Mars jump gates and stuff, and he was yeah. uh, a physicist, and he was very brilliant. He had a lot of inside knowledge, uh, the, the late Henry Deacon. 
he contacted a friend of mine after that Mintaka Stargate was posted, and he had confirmed it to be absolutely true from his inside knowledge. And it's interesting that I've talked to a lot of contactees, and they all claim that, including my Really? You've had contactees affirm that this, they've seen this as well? Yeah. I mean, one of the contactees I originally interviewed, and uh, he's a friend of mine. He'll be here today. Uh, he's arriving tonight, is Derek White Sky Cloud. He was saying since his contact experiences in 2002, he was brought up on these ships, met with these nine foot tall beings. One of them's name was Zael. And they had to go through Orion's belt to, to get out further to their star and where they're going. Wow. This is fascinating stuff. This is a lot to chew on. So that's what you're going to be covering today is the Stargates and... and uh... that's, just a, that's just a small fraction of it because... You see, this subject, it, we're just not even scratching the surface of it. We don't even scratch the surface of where our visitors are coming from. We're talking about visitors coming from not only the outer epidermal layers of the what we call a, a physical layer of our universe, but you might say one day we might discover that Let's say we think we live in a binary universe. Uh, this could be a dimensional thing, right? Is that right. It's not only multidimensional, but what about this? And I, I know this is a stretch. Maybe I'm cramming too much into it. This is a stretch. Nothing he said so far was. Everything else has been... Everything is stretching. Everything is stretching. I'll, okay, I'm with you it, now. This is like slinky. Yeah. Okay. So, essentially, we think our visitors might be coming from, you know, the physical reality, right? Well, we know we live in a multiverse. Well, some people think it's coming that way and in the nuts and bolts spaceships, and others think it's a dimensional, well, yeah, they're coming from another dimension. It is, we, live in, we live in a hollow fractal multi-dimensional multiverse. Okay. Okay, so let's break that down. Okay, so, and why the other universes are so important into this equation, right? Uh, you know if you take something called the Wilkinson's Microwave Ansel Tropy Probe, or the WMAP scan for short. Everybody knows this. Everybody, God. What's wrong with you guys? You're overstating the obvious. Go I, ahead. I know. Okay, so the WMAP scan. We take a radioactive background scan of our universe out there, and what we find is that not only are there these circuitous, repetitive patterns in the background that our universe is constantly expanding itself, and you can use whatever cosmological theory of the day you want to throw in there, Big Bang, expansion theory, replication theory, spinning out new universes. But essentially, that shows us that we're just a little bubble in a vast ocean full of universes. Okay, that's thing number one. Thing number two, we discovered in these scans that our universe is in the shape of a dodecahedron. Well, Plato said in the Timaeus that the cosmos were in that shape. So we should I'd be asking ourselves, how in the hell did he know that, first of all? But second of all, we now believe that we, if we use a powerful enough laser that we can tear the fabric of space-time open and we can inject that full of nanobots and move through it into another universe. So as we're looking at the fact that we live in a multiverse, okay, what the incredible and amazing implications of that are is that we could say that right now we think that we have just this light and dark matter in our universe. And we don't even really know what the hell dark matter might be. It might just be plasma or these ionically charged uh, clouds of gas with plasma or with uh, protons, electrons, and neutrons. We go into this idea that there is a third area. Instead of binary, let's look at trinary. There might be this invisible or void-like state or antimatter-like state. So you know how we're always talking about the spin of particles? Mm -hmm that uh, your chakras are always spinning in Eastern theology. A toroidal field that we find around the Earth. The music of the spheres. The music of the spheres, that we constantly have the spin, everything is in constant motion. Could that, uh, that spin that we find be the, uh, the synergistic effect of our universe spinning and being dependent on other universes? We get that even from the Billy Meyer case. The Billy Meyer case, that we learn about uh, after the, uh, the, the conversations that he starts having with Askett. He, he meets her after uh, Spoth leaves. We learn about the Dern and the Dahl universe, that they say, the Pleiadians say, that they come from this antimatter universe. So what if, you know, when we see different things coming in and of our, out of our reality, that this is just like a neutrino light source brushing up against the fabric of space-time? And let me explain something in layman's terms that makes this really exciting for our future sciences. Okay. 
Right now, we know we are injecting the eyeballs of rats uh, with nanoparticles, okay? These are little graphene-based bits that are only one atom thick. Okay, we won't get into the, the science of how it's like Buckminster Fuller and Buckyballs and all that, how they're powered, you know, bioelectrical fields and stuff like that. We're injecting these eyeballs of rats with these so they can see night vision. We're now moving into the infrared spectrum, okay? So hmm. we're going to see things around us that we've never perceived before. Dimensions are subjective. There is no lower or higher dimension. They're just different places that you're standing in the room. We are already existing in a multi-dimensional multiverse, but we're only perceiving things at a, a certain frequency. So you could say our visitors and these experiences are coming from every level, and we're connected to it. How can you possibly grasp all that? That is exactly. a lot, man. That is a lot. You seem to be like tying all these different areas together, which is interesting to sort of substantiate some of these other different well, areas, you. which is really exciting and interesting. I uh, appreciate you coming by and talking to us. And uh, when, are you speaking here tomorrow? I'm speaking here tomorrow, but do you know what my, the two things I want to say, for just Please a quick message, me. quick message, okay? So I want to talk about really quickly, a message for everybody at home, what you can expect in the future. Please right. tell us that. We have an exciting future ahead of us. And there's all kinds of amazing things that we should be prepared for. You know, a lot of people right now are worried about RFID microchips. Uh, they're worried about things like Neuralink and wetware and uh, going into that direction. That's just the T-Model Ford edition. We will move into an area of using transdermal tattoos. We will move into an area of using the same sort of nano uh, implants that will go in the body to unlock the mitochondria in your cell. Yeah, but we, we will unlock the mitochondria in your cell so that it will be at a point where you will use the nitrogen and hydrogen from outside of your body so that you don't need to eat or drink, okay? Uh, you will be connected into a quantum field of information, and it's important that we don't just bury our heads in the sand because these are technological training wheels. If we're not careful, that sort of thing could turn us into a hive mind, but if we open up our eyes and see that we are evolving in all different sorts of ways, it's, it's going to be an amazing future. And the most important takeaway we have to look at is that no matter how dark it gets out there in the world, Ron, no matter how dark it gets, you can use your light to burn like beacons against the darkness. And with that, create the future. Wow, with that, go get some ayahuasca, sit down, start from the <laughs> beginning, see if you can grasp any of that. Not at all where I thought he was going to go, but it's interesting stuff. I like the way you do tie it all together and you try to substantiate from all these different genres, which is really cool. And I appreciate you talking to us here. For Truth Be Told and Tony Sweet, this is Captain Ron here at the 2020 uh, we're at UFO Mega, Con uh, Mega... Yes, Laughlin UFO Mega Conference. Yeah, I keep saying it it's wrong. It's 2020, not 2021. <laughs> but then come to 2021. All right. Uh, thanks so much. We'll see you later.